A long time ago, man tried imitating the image of his celestial god and created a sphere. With it, he recreated his movement and began to adore him. At some point, ceremonies celebrated with the sacred sphere derived into games of talent and skill. Rivalry and competitive spirit did the rest. In the course of more than 2,000 years, warriors and noblemen of ancient Eastern dynasties, American pre-Columbian priests, Roman soldiers, medieval knights and commoners slowly created the most popular sport on the planet. And football became a reality thanks to a group of wonderful madmen that met in 1863 at a London tavern to establish the rules. But those men discussed the standards of a game that already existed, a game that was practiced by their ancestors. The question is, since when? Let's travel back in time to search for the origins of football. Our story takes us back to the second century in a small Breton village. The Romans were threatening their towns and traditions, but this was a sacred night. The Druids lit a purifying flame to prepare for the Lunessa, the festival in honor of the sun god, Lu. At sunrise, they celebrated a ceremony that welcomed Lu, considered to be the maker of light. With a simple prayer, they would ask his wife, the earth goddess, to bless their harvest and have the sun protect them with its warmth and light. A druid would raise a rustic leather sphere towards the sky in a simple representation of the sun. These ceremonies, however, weren't exclusive to the Druids and the Celtic people. In many other parts of the world, similar scenes were being carried out. Priests from very different cultures used similar spherical objects to worship the great fountain of life, the sun. One of nature's greatest mysteries was the setting and rising of this celestial body. The high priest shows the others the movement of the sun. He pleads for it not to be detained during his voyage through the skies. Life must continue, and harvests must be claimed. The city of Teotihuacan was first built in times of Jesus Christ, but its civilization disappeared 700 years later. In this mural, essential to understanding their customs, we can appreciate a great variety of games that were practiced with a ball. The inhabitants of this enigmatic city, like many others, used a sacred sphere for something other than venerating the sun god. Back then, the most important events in the lives of these people were sowing and harvesting. So during those days, more than any other, they needed to ask or thank the gods for their benevolence. The priests conceived ceremonies to plead the sun for light and to favor the success of the harvest. Symbolically, the mere contact of the sacred ball with the earth represented the act of fertilization. Over time, these rituals gave way to other ball games. 
A match between two clans in Teotihuacan is about to begin. Quickly, we realize that it resembles our game of football. The Teotihuacan game consisted of moving the ball to the opposing team's end by touching it a maximum of four times and only with their feet, forearms, or hips. The ball could be hit directly or after one single bounce, not more. The playing field was circumscribed by four fixed markers. Two other mobile markers signaled the dividing line between opponents. When a team failed, the mobile marker moved back, setting a new dividing line and reducing the opponent's territory. When one of the teams managed to move the dividing line all the way back, they earned a point. The first team who marked five points would win the game. The people of Teotihuacan were the first to create a ball that would bounce. Unlike the Celts, this ball wasn't made of animal hide, but of a material unknown to the rest of the world, rubber. The red team striker is about to reach the opponent's goalpost. One more point, and they'll celebrate victory. The players on the green team are unable to regain the ball, and the red team wins. It becomes evident that the Teotihuacan game has certain similarities with football, but its practice became extinct along with their civilization. Players in other ball games that appeared in America with these characteristics would not use their feet to hit the ball. Our journey takes us back to Britannia, where the Romans have defeated the Britons. Exhausted and having suffered many casualties, the Romans are forced to recruit new soldiers. For months, the new recruits are submitted to an infinite amount of physical exercise and military instruction. The long marches where they would carry heavy equipment alternated with combat techniques. Those who didn't keep up were expelled. One of the exercises that stood out among the future soldiers was called harpastum. In ancient Europe, ceremonies using the sacred sphere derived in recreational practices. First were the Greeks and then the Romans who created different ball games. Roman instructors applied this game to combat the harpastum was both simple and brutal. In a rectangular shaped field, two teams had to fight for the ball and move it behind the opposing team's dividing line by employing all necessary violence. The custom at this training camp consisted of celebrating a match of harpastum between the instructors and the new recruits. Their rage, so ingrained at this point, gives them strength. They've lost their fear. The head instructor exhausted by the match, understands that it won't be an easy win. The decisive point is yet to be won. If they pull it off, their opponents will be defeated.
Although sometimes they used their feet to kick the ball, it wasn't the custom when playing Harpastum. Yet the shape of the field, the scoring of points, and its competitive nature would be decisive in the future. The inhabitants of the small Breton village walked to the sacred site of the ancient Druids. When they are all gathered, the sound of a horn reaches the neighboring village, announcing a challenge. They await their answer with impatience. If they reply, the great game will begin. The challenge has been accepted, and there's no time to lose. Both villages must meet at an established place, a piece of painted wood on a tree on the outskirts of the village. To the river! They all run towards the river to meet their adversaries. The game must begin. Their Breton ancestors also created games based on ancient Celtic solar rites, but 400 years of Roman culture supplied them with the competitive factor. Once they come face to face, the leader of the defiant village confronts his rivals. <laughs> Taking advantage of their opponent's confusion, they manage to pass the ball to a player who, avoiding the enemy, runs forward towards the rival village. His goal is to hit the ball against the piece of wood tied to the tree. Throughout centuries of Roman rule, Bretons incorporated Harpastum's competitive nature into their primitive Celtic games. And this was the result. Men, women, and children fought to move the leather ball to the opponent's field. Does this sound familiar? The representation of Sun, the Celtic sun goddess, became the Sun, a ball that gave its name to the games played by the Bretons. The mountains, rivers, and valleys separating both villages would become the playing field. The game lasted all day. Even though the norm would be to carry the ball and protect it from the opponents by using their hands, kicking it added speed and avoided unnecessary tackling. Sooner or later, the Sul gets trapped in a crowded melee where only a few players are able to pass the ball to the fastest members of their team. As the sun sets, the neighbors that set the challenge have managed to move the ball close to the other village's wooden piece. Their opponents resist desperately. Suddenly, someone signals. Following a set plan, they pass the ball to a girl who hits the leather sphere against the piece of wood, obtaining their victory. Their triumph will travel throughout the region. 
And the minstrels, together with the heroes of the Soon, will sing of their heroic deed. Today is Shrove Tuesday, and the neighbors of a small town in Ashburn get ready for the Royal Shrovetide football, a match that has been in dispute ever since the 12th century. After we hear God Save the Queen, it's time for the kickoff, and the match begins. In the 11th century, the ancient Celtic game, transformed into what we know as Sun, made its comeback to England thanks to the Normans. Its practice quickly extended, especially during Carnival. It was then that the word football was used for the first time. The Shrovetide football is the carnival football. The goalposts have been set by the riverbed with a five kilometer distance from each other. The objective is to hit the ball three times against a grindstone that has been embedded into a stone wall. The word goal comes from the Germanic the mother tongue of the Saxons and Normans, and it means objective or target. In Ashburn, the legendary Workington Manual is still in use today, establishing that anything, except killing, is permitted in order to move the ball towards the opponent's goalpost. Although medieval football didn't reach its splendor until the 14th and 15th centuries, it didn't go well for the people in power. During the Hundred Years' War, the commoners couldn't waste any time playing, Instead, they needed to enlist in the army. To make matters worse, playing during holidays reduced the number of patrons of the clergy, and the commotion along the streets unsettled commerce and the authorities. In the midst of the 16th century, Oliver Cromwell banned the practice of football, but one of his ancestors...